Well, this morning we are back in the book of Acts, and we are looking at passage from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through to 41. Now, I'm going to leave that to you to read in your homes this morning, uh, but we will get straight into the message. Uh, Every two years, Ligonier Ministries, along with uh, Lifeway Research, conduct a survey of some 3,000 people uh, in America. Now, the the information or the the, uh, feedback is actually quite surprising. A religious survey, and this would be quite different to what we would have in Australia, a more secular nation. So let's have a look at some of the answers to some of the questions. What is surprising is that more than two-thirds, that's 69% of Americans, disagree that the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. And 58% strongly disagree. A majority of US adults, 59%, say that the Holy Spirit is a force, perhaps that's taken from Star Wars, than he is a person. Now, what is more surprising, that's the general populace, but what about among evangelicals? Well, here we have some uh, statistics. 52% say that all people are mostly good. 51% of evangelicals said God accepts worship from all religions. Jesus is not the only way, says 51%. And 78% said Jesus was the first and greatest being created by God, the Father. So according to Scripture, what we have here is that over half evangelicals believe in heresy according to Scripture. Now, such a result among evangelicals is alarming to say the least. And I cannot help but think of the Lord's words before he left when he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This morning's message is titled, If Jesus is Lord, Everything Changes. This message is an attempt to ensure that you are not one who will come to the end of your life crying, Lord, Lord, only to find the answer coming back, I never knew you, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Now this morning I have taken in one sense the easy road. I am borrowing another man's sermon to give you this morning. But this is not an ordinary sermon. Uh, This would be perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached bar that preached by the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the sermon is none other than the Apostle Paul's sermon that launched the church at the coming of the Holy Spirit. And some 3,000 people heard the sermon and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and repented and were added to the church. The sermon was prompted by a question from the response of the people watching the magnificent and miraculous signs of the Holy Spirit as the disciples spoke in languages that were not their own. And they looked with amazement and perplexity and said in verse um, 22, or sorry, verse 12, what does this mean? What does this mean? And at the end of the sermon, they cry out to Peter, what shall we do? What shall we do? Now, remarkably, only 50 days ago, Peter had committed one of the greatest denials probably in all of human history. In bold-faced confidence, Peter stood up among his disciples. Jesus was there. And he said, Jesus, let everyone else deny you. I will never deny you. (coughs) And then hours later, he heard the words come out of his own mouth that he would never have have envisaged. A A young girl, servant girl, says, weren't you one of them? And he said, woman, I do not know him. That is Christ. I do not know him. Not, he did not just say it once. 
nor twice, but he said it three times. And now, now Peter, forgiven, he is reinstated back to his position and he is empowered by the Holy Spirit, steps forward to preach one of the most Christ-honoring, simplest, clearest and convicting messages ever preached by a man. And the basic message is simply, accept God's appointed Redeemer and King and live. Accept God's appointed Redeemer and King and live. The message is quite simple. We will look at three main facts, three facts with one conclusion. And we'll follow the text, three facts, one conclusion. Fact one, the last days have come, verses 14 to 21. The last days have come. Peter hushes the crowd and he tells them to listen up. Listen to what I am saying. Let it be known to you and give ear to my words. And in one sense, he might begin with a touch of humor. Uh, One group of the crowd, or most of them said, what does this mean in verse 12? And others said, (laughs) these men are drunk. And no doubt that would have had raucous laughter. And Peter, uh, probably to get alongside, said, no, these people are not drunk. It is only 9 a.m. in the morning. Rather, what you are witnessing is a fulfillment of what the prophet Joel prophesied. And let us read what this was. He says in verse 16, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, This was a, uh, a prophecy spoken by Joel at a time when Israel had rejected their God. And God brought locusts to devastate the land. And the call then as it is now, is repent because, Joel says to the people of Israel then, a greater um, judgment is going to be coming by the Lord on that magnificent day. And he says that these last days, that Joel spoke of in the last days, It shall be so. These signs will be a manifestation of the coming day of judgment of the Lord. Uh, These days, these last days will be inaugurated as, um, as the Jewish people would have known as they look back in the Old Testament, inaugurated by the coming of the Messiah. But neither the Jews nor the disciples then understood that between the coming of the last days and the day of the Lord, there was going to be some 2,000 plus years. See, they saw the eschatological timeline to be the last days commence when the Messiah comes, the Spirit is poured out, and the day of the Lord comes. It was like a boom, 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 automatically one after the other. But they didn't realize that what they were experiencing at this point was the inauguration of the last days that would trigger the timer for God himself to come or the day of the Lord to come, that day of judgment. So what it, what occurred at Pentecost was a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy 
but it was an in, in inauguration of that. Uh, previously in the Old Testament, prophets and kings were anointed by the Spirit uh, for particular purposes. But now it says that the Spirit will be poured out in those last days on all flesh. And here we have in the upper room, the disciples, uh, women, and groups of believers be the, with the Spirit poured out into them on all types of flesh. It's not just going to be for the rich or the talented or the privileged or the kings or the nobles. No, it is going to be for everyone, for sons and daughters, young and old, male and female servants. But what are we to make of the spectacular signs? Because it says that they will prophesy, they will dream dreams, they will have visions. Well, in one sense, we see this happen at Pentecost. Uh, they began, began to prophesy, speak in the wondrous works of God in other languages. Uh, we saw, we see in, through the New Testament, Peter, or in Acts, Peter and Paul have visions and dreams. Uh, John, has a, a vision of what will happen and writes it down called the book of Revelation. But in the New Testament, these prophecies, visions and dreams were rare as they are now. Um, and, and I would say that prophetic word has stopped at the closure of the canon of Scripture. But remember, it inaugurated, it set the timer for the day of the Lord to come. And it would seem to be when the day of the Lord will come, probably in the great tribulation, that the, these manifestations of, of prophecies and dreams and visions will be far greater. And it says that not only will be these, these manifestations, but there will be a terrible day of judgment come in at the day of the Lord in verses 19 to 20. My spirit will be poured out on all believers, but God's judgment will be poured out on all flesh. Uh, there will be manifestations in the heavens uh, and on earth, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. Uh, the, the moon will be turned to blood and the, the sun will be darkened. These are manifestations of God's judgment. When did this occur or when will this occur? Some see this as happening or uh, being fulfilled at the death of Christ. But we never saw um, blood and, and smoke and vapor, uh, nor was the moon turned to blood. Some would see it at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But once again, uh, Jewish historians do not uh, state that these things occurred. Others would put it down to some sort of... Uh, figurative speaking of a spiritual reality. Now, I think the best thing to see this as is it is going to happen. It is going to happen, notice in verse 21, when the day of the Lord shall come. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 20. And when will this occur? This will occur, occur at the end of the last days. And Revelation 6, 12 help us with this. Let me read it to you and you can see the parallel here. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood. Here we have the uh, manifestation of what Joel is talking about. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its wintered fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Unbelievable manifestations. And let's just say, the people did not get their iPhones out at that point in time to live video stream this. What were the people doing? Well, it goes on in verse 15. It says, the kings of the earth and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves 
in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day, for the great day of their wrath has come and who shall stand? This is the day what the, uh, Joel is talking about. And no wonder Joel at the end of that, in verse 21, says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What would the crowd have been thinking at this time? Now, we've got to remember that this is, these are devout Jewish people. They are there at the, uh, at Pentecost for the uh, week of feasts. These are devout men and women. Uh, th- no doubt th- they would have said, we are the chosen ones of Israel. Uh, We will not face this judgment. The Gentiles, the the Roman occupation, yes, smite them, God, but not us at this point in time. Uh, We will be safe. We are the chosen. It's like people today. I come from a Christian family. I go to church. I'm not that bad. But notice this, the fact one is that what is clear is that the coming of the Holy Spirit set off the last days. The next appointed time is the great day of the Lord that will come with judgment. Where will they stand on that great day? They could have perceived that they will be fine. I wonder where you will stand. But then we take it to the next fact. Fact two. Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Now, throughout Jesus' life, he declared that he was the Son of God and that God was his Father. In John 8, 41, the Jews told Jesus, we have one Father, even God. So notice this. The Jews say, we have one Father, even God. Jesus replies in John 8, 42, if God were your Father, you would love me. If you perceive that God is your Father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Because... You cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. Jesus is saying, you claim to have God as your father, but you deny the very one sent from God, the one endorsed by God, the father. Therefore, God is not your father, the devil is. If you do not affirm God's work in me, Jesus is saying, then you do not. Worship God. If you do not accept who I am, then your father is the devil. Loving God means affirming all that Jesus is. You reject God's affirmation of Jesus and you ultimately reject God. Everything hinges on Jesus. And Peter says, the last days have begun The Holy Spirit has been poured out and the Messiah has come. Now he will show them who this Messiah is. Peter turns from talking about Joel and he turns to the crowd and he says in verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. And he will finish this message in verse 36 with these words, Know for certain that God has made him, that's Jesus, both Lord and Christ. And Peter now is wanting to state the last days have come, the Holy Spirit's been poured out, Messiah has to have come. Jesus is the Messiah. You claim to know the Father, then you better not reject the Son. Five facts or five endorsements that God gives Jesus to prove this. Five. Number one, God approved 
Jesus as Lord through his miracles. Notice this in verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Notice this. A man attested. The um, King James Version says, approved by God. Note the implication. When Jesus did a miracle, God gave him affirmation. When Jesus did a miracle, it was as though God was saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Look to him. But not only was that miracle an affirmation of God's approval of Jesus, God was actually doing the miracle through Jesus because it says that these signs, these wonders that God did through him in your midst. God healed the leper through Jesus. God calmed the storm through Jesus. God raised the dead through Jesus. God spoke the word through Jesus. God approves Christ. And he says, as you yourselves are witnesses. God approved Jesus through the mighty miracles. Do you? Do you see that those miracles performed by Jesus was actually performed by God and the affirmation of Jesus as the Messiah? And you might say, well, I'll give him that. I'll give that one. Yes, yeah, sure, Jesus did miracles and God did them through him. Second point of the fact that Jesus is both Lord and Saviour, God approved Jesus as Lord through his death. God approved Jesus as Lord through his death. Notice verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Now this one right here, that must have absolutely stumped the Jews listening. See, they believed that if anyone hangs on a tree, they are not endorsed by the Father. They are cursed by the Father. And to the Jew, Christ's death was nothing but a confirmation of some lunatic blasphemer that made it completely impossible for Jesus to be the Messiah. And Peter shows, though, that actually not the enemies, the enemies of Jesus didn't kill him so much, though they were, they did it willingly, and they'll receive judgment for it, he says. But no, this was actually part of God's predetermined plan to put Christ to death. And they should have known this if they read their Old Testaments. Isaiah 53.10, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has, been, he has put him to grief. He was killed by the predetermined plan of God. And didn't Jesus himself say this? On the road to Emmaus, uh, where the disciples were uh, bewildered that their Savior had died. The resurrected Christ comes alongside. And it says, Luke 24, 46, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Why? And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Why did God predetermine the Savior's death? Well, none other reason so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, that they would receive forgiveness through his death. 
Oh, this puts to death the whole concept that, that Jesus, uh, that anyone can worship Jesus. That, that, um, my sin is not that bad. That, that everyone is ultimately good. Well, if everyone's good, then why did Jesus have to die? No. Jesus' death was a predetermined plan of God that became the endorsement of Jesus as the Savior. Love this quote. Jesus' death was not an indictment of Christ. Rather, it was an endorsement of his infinite worth. See, Jesus, on his earthly life, fixed his eyes on Jerusalem, not as a defeated foe, but as a man going to his victory to conquer death and sin and the judgment for all who would come in and find their salvation in him. God approved Jesus by planning his death for sin. Do you? So this is where it gets harder, doesn't it? Do you believe God? Do you believe in the Father? Yes, I believe in God. Then you cannot reject his son that died for your sin. Am I that bad? Yes. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Reject the offering, you reject the Father. Reject the Savior, you reject the Father. Third aspect of this, God approved Jesus as Lord by raising him from the dead. Now this is the greatest endorsement of all. Uh, We've looked at the life of Christ in one verse. We've looked at the death of Christ in one verse. And now we have the resurrection of Christ in nine verses. Now let's look at the immediate contrast here. Verse 23 and 24, you crucified him, you rejected him, but God raised him, God appointed him, God approved him by loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. You said no to Jesus, God says yes to Jesus and raises him from the dead. And Peter comes and quotes Psalm 16 of David to show that what David actually spoke were the words of Jesus. He spoke prophetically concerning Christ in verses 25 to 28. And just to reiterate that, look at verse 30. It says about David, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. So when we read this in verse 25 to 28, David is speaking as Christ, in the words of Christ. And what does Christ say? I saw the Lord God always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. I love the sarcasm that Peter probably uses here. He says, brothers, in verse 29, I say to you with confidence that the patriarch David, um, he died, he was buried. And by the way, his tomb is just over there. But here, he says in verse 32, but you are all witnesses to the resurrection. God, David's tomb is occupied Jesus' tomb is empty. God said yes to Jesus' death as the right, perfect, and complete payment for your sin and my sin. The resurrection is the crowning endorsement of God. 
God approved Jesus by raising him from the dead. Do you? This would be very hard for the people to hear at that time. They were God-fearing. They were God-loving, God-honouring people. They could quote vast swathes of scripture. But Peter is saying to them, you are here for the week of feasts. You are here worshipping me. You're going to church. You say you love the the Father, but you rejected the Son. God endorsed him. Do you stand with God or do you stand against God? This must be cut in their heart to pieces right now. Fourth, God approved Jesus as Lord by exalting him as king. Verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. And then Peter quotes uh, down in verse 34 and 35, also Psalm of David, Psalm 110, and noting that he exalted him and made his enemies his footstool. Not only is Jesus now the Messiah, he has also been raised to the highest and most exalted position of all, and anyone who stands opposed to him becomes an enemy of him, and he will make them a footstool. How do we know this? He says, for the miracles you're witnesses, for the death you've witnessed it, for the resurrection you've witnessed it. But how do we know this? Well, notice what Peter says in verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of the hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. How do I know that the Lord Jesus is exalted to the highest place because he took the Holy Spirit, having achieved that, and poured it out upon his people. That is the endorsement. That shows that Jesus is indeed exalted and reigning supreme. And then Peter takes his sword of the Spirit and casts the mortal blow straight into the heart of his listeners. Verse 33, 4, he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Well, Peter doesn't hold back. Two facts. The last days have come. The last thing we got at any point of time is that the Lord, the day of the Lord will come. Second is that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. God the Father has endorsed, has authenticated, has approved God the Son. Through his miracles, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, through the exaltation with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And then last fact, and that is you and I have crucified Christ. You and I have crucified Christ. I want you to understand why this last statement that he says is so powerful and must be understood by every person listening. What did Peter mean? That Jesus whom you crucify. Sure, there would have been some in the crowd who did crucify him, who did cry out, crucify him, crucify him. But what about you if I ask you? Did you kill Jesus? You might say, no, I didn't kill Jesus. Judas betrayed him for money. Uh, The Jewish religious um, leaders uh, tried him uh, for jealousy. Uh, Pilate condemned him. Uh, because he wanted a peaceful life. Uh, The Jews there cried out, crucify him, crucify him. No, I didn't kill him. I love what John Stott said. He said, everyone who has sinned 
is guilty of the death of Christ because they're because his blood paid for sin. Every sin of his people was laid upon him. But I think there's also a more direct and conscious way that we have crucified Christ. And I think John Piper points this out well, that the essence of the crime against Jesus is not so much putting an end to his physical life, but rather the essence of the crime against Jesus was rejection of God in Jesus' life. Jesus died and was tried as a blasphemer. They rejected God's role in his life and God approved him as the son of God in his life. And so to reject God's approval of Jesus is to call him a blasphemer and to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Did you understand that? If I reject Jesus as endorsed by God through his miracles, through his death, through his resurrection, through his exaltation, then I am saying, you're a blasphemer, Jesus. And you must be, you should be crucified. Mahatma Gandhi held Christ in such high esteem while rejecting the claims of his messiahship. He took from his life and teachings of Jesus those Principles he found useful without bothering to accept the claim that the Lord Christ is the Savior. Well, many have found Jesus offensive. And I will take him, I'll take uh, him as a good teacher. Speaking to someone this week who said, I'll take him as a good teacher, but all the other things I will not take. You take him as a good teacher, you do not endorse him. You are not approved, approving what God has approved, and ultimately, all of us, when we do that, we are calling out, crucify him, crucify him, you blasphemer. Fact one, the last days have begun. The day of the Lord is nigh. Fact two, Jesus is Lord and Christ, endorsed by God. Fact three, if you do not acknowledge that, you are crucifying Christ this very day and calling him a blasphemer. The only conclusion that Peter says at this point in time is simply, save yourselves. Save yourselves. Verse 37 to 41. Let me read verse 40. It says that many other words were, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Almost like the, the words that the angel said to Lot, flee, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away from the punishment of the city. And Peter, he's giving you and I a very pointed an important warning, save yourselves. And the reaction of these ones, verse 37, was beautiful. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. They realized the implication, in the, their implication in the murder of Christ. They realized that they stood condemned and that vengeance must come upon them. And those terrors of Joel will come. They realized the urgency of the hour. The time was ticking. At any moment, judgment could fall. They realized their need to be released from dispense with all the pretense of religiosity. And they realized the pressing need to be released from the power of sin that has caused them and you and I to drift along that crooked and wide road leading all the way to hell. And they cried out as only any sane person would cry out, brothers, what shall we do? And we all must come to this point in time in the face of Christ Brothers, what shall we do? 
And Peter was ready to give the greatest answer. He says in verse 37, 38 and 39, repent, repent, and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, even you, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This must have been astounding. He says, repent, turn from your wicked ways, turn from living the life for yourself, turn from being king or queen of your life and turn to the Messiah. Repent of your sins. Acknowledge that you have sinned against the Lord Jesus Christ and you have crucified him. And be baptized. Be baptized is this meaning to believe. Doesn't mean that by baptism you are saved. In the New Testament, repentance and baptism are so closely put together. All it's saying is believe and make it known. Repent and trust in Jesus for your life. Repent and believe. Make it public. One great travesty is that while 3,000 people repented and believed and were added to the church that day, which was remarkable, I dare say it that so many didn't. They all heard the message, but so many didn't hear the message personally. At my previous church in in the US, uh, there was one lady who had sat under the gospel year in and year out And she thought it's time to be baptized. And going through the baptism class and I asked her to tell me her testimony. And what was very evident was that she did not understand or believe the gospel. Though the gospel had been proclaimed week in and week out. Could that be you? Oh, you are holding on to your good works, your religious talk, your coming to the church. But do you believe the gospel? Have you come to the end of yourself. If you know no emptiness, then you will know no filling of Christ in your life. If you have never acknowledged that you are poor in spirit, you will never experience the kingdom of heaven. Have you heard the message this morning? No, listen. Have you heard personally, the message this morning. If Jesus is Lord, everything changes. Has he changed you? Let us pray. Our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, we acknowledge you as one endorsed, authenticated, approved by God the Father through your miracles, through your death for our sins, for your resurrection and for your exaltation. You are the Lord and you call all men and women, boys and girls to come to a saving knowledge of you. May you humble us this day and may those who are far off come near, repent and believe. The promise is for them, the promise is for you. God, may you do a work of salvation even this day. And may the angels rejoice in heaven over one that might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.